is where they are. I pray that they can feel your spirit where they are. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on us. As we come to now, come now to this moment of preaching, I've said it, but I need your spirit. I prepared, but I need your power. Speak, Lord, for your servants are listening. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, can we take time to just honor your pastor, your leader, the reverend, Reverend Tim Tillman? Come on, let's thank God for Pastor Tillman. And to the officers and staff of this wonderful church, even in the midst of this pandemic, oh, bro, you have continued to make ministry possible. And we thank God for that. Grab your Bible and turn with me to 1 Samuel chapter 16. I'm excited about being at Oak Road. Thank you for being a good this morning. I pray that you are ready to worship. If not, you missed it when the praise team was up. You are be ready now to worship. First Samuel chapter 16, beginning at verse number 1. First Samuel chapter 16, beginning at verse number 1. The text says, Now the Lord said to Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul? Seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel. 
fill your heart with oil and go. I am sending you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I uh -huh. have provided myself a king among his sons. Well. And Samuel said, how can I go? If Saul hears it, he will kill me. But the Lord said, take a helper with you uh -huh. and say, I have come to sacrifice the Lord. Then invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what you shall do. You will anoint for me the one I named you. That's good. Yes, sir. So Samuel did what the Lord said and went to Bethlehem, and the elders of the town trembled at his coming and said, Do you come peacefully? He said, Peacefully I come. I come to sacrifice to the Lord. Sanctify yourself and come with me to the sacrifice. Then he consecrated Jesse and his sons invited them to the sacrifice. Uh -huh. So it was when they came that he looked at Elab and said, surely the Lord's anointed is before you. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look at his appearance or at his physical stature because I have refused him. For the Lord does not see as man sees. The man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be unto God. I look back at verse number one. Verse number one says, Now the Lord said to Samuel, How long will you cry for Saul, saying, I rejected him from reigning over Israel? I want to talk on the subject this morning. I've got another one. I've got another one. I've got another one. I've got another one grass withers and the flower the rub fades away but the word of our God shall stand forever. Just tell somebody he's got another one. He's got another one. <laughs> the people of God had an issue. Their issue was not was that ever since the beginning of time they were really never satisfied with what God was doing. They were always in a desperate need for more. Even when they left Egypt and finally made it to Canaan when there were houses that they did not have to build, vineyards that they did not have to plant, and wells that they did not have to dig, they were still not satisfied. Brothers and sisters, they weren't even satisfied with God. Up until the book of Samuel, God had ruled the nation, raising up leaders as they were needed. This was how things operated all the way from the time of Moses through the days of the judges, whenever they disobeyed. God placed them in captivity, and whenever they came to their senses and recognized God, God called for a judge to deliver them and lead them until they died. This wasn't enough for them. They wanted to be like everyone around them. They didn't want God, but in fact, they wanted a king. And woe unto man, woe unto woman, whenever you replace the creator with the creation. They were warned that elevating a person to the throne would bring political corruption and trouble. They were warned that by elevating a man on their own would bring a lot of turmoil, would bring a lot of strife, would bring a lot of trouble, but yet they wanted to do it anyway. God gave them what they wanted, and for 40 years they were led by a man named Saul. He gives Samuel who ruled or he gives Samuel a role that was multifaceted because not only was Samuel the last judge but he was also the priest, the seer and the prophet to anoint Saul and to be there as Saul's guide. Mm -hmm. Things went well for a couple of years but like everything we put in our hands in and on as human beings we mess it up. It's just reality. He let the power corrupt him to the point, Saul did, where he started manipulating people, misusing power, and mismanaging provisions that God had placed in his hands. Let me say that one more time. As he rose to power, he became corrupt to the point where he started manipulating people, misusing the power and mismanaging provisions that God had placed in his hands. Don't that sound familiar? I mean, for the past couple of years, we've been dealing with a man who has been manipulating people. We've been dealing with a man and his captain who has misused his power. We've been dealing with a man who has even mismanaged provisions. Thus, why we are still, this is why we are still in the middle of a pandemic where 11 million people 
people have tested positive and over 240,000 people have died. Why? Because we have a man who's manipulated people. He's misused his power and even mismanaged the provisions that God placed in his hand. And God had had enough of it. God had had enough of that. God had had enough of Saul's leadership. And in chapter 15 of 1 Samuel, God rejects him as a king. In fact, in chapter 15, God rejects that he even made Saul a king. This was the second time that God rejected to do anything, regretted rather to do anything. The first time was when God regretted that he made man in Genesis 5. However, this regret was not an admission of error, but rather an expression of sorrow simply because an omniscient God can make mistakes. While God didn't change God's mind, God did change God's attitude towards Saul. He leaves him on the throne. He rejects him as a king, but he never rejected him as a person. I think I need to say that for the folk in the back. He leaves him on the throne, all the while rejecting him as king, but he never rejected Saul as a person. Can I say that one more time? He rejected him as the king, but leaves him on the throne, but never rejected him as a person. And this calls me to see something about God, and that is God will leave you in a position as a figurehead all the while replacing you with somebody else he can trust. Saul is rejected. And when we get to our text, Samuel is grieving. Saul is rejected. Samuel is grieving until God shows Samuel, I've got another one. Brothers and sisters, when you take a look at this text, the first thing you'll see, and I promise you, I'm almost finished, you'll see a reproach. In, in the beginning of verse number one, the ending of chapter 15 this details that after Samuel tells Saul that the Lord has rejected him, because Saul is more concerned with how people saw him versus how God saw him, he begs that Samuel go back to worship with him so that at least the people can see that Samuel still supports him. He was more concerned with making sure that his appearance to people looked like he was still a king versus seeing if God had already honored him as the king. Samuel does it. But when they leave, they go their separate ways. Saul never sees Samuel again until the day he dies. And while they are separated from each other, Saul becomes mentally deranged while Samuel becomes mentally depressed. And God has had enough of it. God visits Samuel and asks him, how long are you going to cry over spilled milk? Seeing that I rejected Saul as king. He asks, Samuel, how long are you going to cry over Saul when I've already rejected him as being king? Now, please hear me clearly, O bro. God is not against grief. God was not against Samuel crying. God is not against Samuel feeling some type of way over the fact that for years he's tried to work with Saul and steer Saul in the right direction, but he wouldn't listen. However, God was against Samuel taking his grief to heart and staying in it too long. God reproached Samuel because he was wasting valuable time. Mourning over someone who wasn't dead, but rather who God had rejected. And I think, brothers and sisters, one of our faults is that we cry over things longer than necessary, especially those things that weren't good for us in the first place. They were having a company in here. Now let me say this, Samuel's mourning could be this way because maybe to be rejected by God is like death. But Samuel, God never rejected Saul as a person. He just rejected the position. God, God never rejected Samuel or Saul as his child. God never rejected Saul as a person, but he rejected him as the king. And God asked Samuel, how long? How long are you going to cry? And I want to ask that same question this morning. How long? How long are you going to cry over boo-boo after boo-boo has hurt you so many times? How long? How long? 
how long are you going to cry when God removes you from a job but yet he's in you? He's allowed you to wait in your waiting room so that he can prepare you for something better. How long? How long are you going to cry over the folk that have walked out of your life knowing good and well they didn't mean you any good? How long? How long are you going to cry over the people that God allowed you to see them for who they really were? And when you got a chance to see them for who they really were, you finally realize who they really were. How long? How long are you going to cry? How long? How long are you going to sit and be mad about what I'm doing? How long, Samuel, are you going to mourn? There was a reproach. But watch this. God sends a replacement. He said, let it be known. I want, you to show, I want to show you something because right there in verse 1, he asked Samuel, how long are you going to cry over Saul? I've rejected him as a king, but while I've rejected him, I have not rejected him without replacing him. Let it be known that God never rejects without replacing. God tells Samuel, instead of you mourning, instead of you crying, instead of you moping, instead of you walking around like a wandering quack, my get up and fill your horn. Fill your horn with oil because I'm sending you on another assignment. I'm sending you to Bethlehem because I have provided myself with a king. Y'all, y'all miss where to shout. Saul was the people's king. Saul was the people's king. They wanted Saul. Saul was the king that the people put their hand on. Saul was the king that the people, or that was the king that the people thought they needed. But God said, I'm going to give you who you really need. And I just want to stop by and tell somebody that what people might think you need, God will make sure he'll send you what you really need. God says, listen, instead of you moaning or mourning over a man that the people selected, get up and let me give you somebody that I have provided. I provided. I provided myself with the king. This new king was God's selection to be king. Just like God raised up judges and prophets for his people, he would raise up a king for his people. This replacement church was not to be found by Samuel, but rather God would show him where to go to find him. Whenever God rejects and replaces, you'll never have to go searching for the replacement because God will either direct your steps to it or God will send it your way. Yeah. Would you tell somebody you ain't got to go searching for it because God has a way of ordering your steps to it. And if you ain't blind enough to see it, God will either make it come in your lap or he'll make you walk right into it. Would you tell somebody God has another replacement? God, God has another replacement. You've got replacement. You got replacement, but keep reading because at the end of this, verse 1, all the way into verse 5, you'll see a requirement. His first requirement was to get up. He tells them, get up. You, you cannot stay here in this condition any longer. Get up. Would you go on and type to somebody, get up? I, I mean, I, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. It feels better to lay down. I know it feels better to just sit here and cry and have your box of Kleenex right next beside you. I know it feels better to just move around. Get up. I, I know you may not understand why you got to get up, but get up. I know you may not understand when this thing will change, but get up. He tells them, get up and fill your horn. With oil. Go down to Bethlehem. The word Bethlehem means the house of bread. Go down, go down to Bethlehem. Go to Jesse's house. And when you get there, the other requirements will be given to you. Samuel said, well, look, now I know you want me to get up and I know you want me to go and anoint, you know, the king. But, but, but I got to ask you something. How can I do that? Because if Saul hears about it, he'll kill me. God says, I'll tell you how you get around that. When you go, take you a helper with you. <laughs> take, take, take you something to sacrifice with you. Because what it's going to look like is that you're just going down there to prepare for worship. And Saul ain't going to say nothing to you if you're just going down there to prepare for, prepare for worship. So take you, this little helper with you, go down to Jesse's house, and when you get there, I'll tell you what you need to do. Jesse and his sons, the Bible says, had to be consecrated. They had to be consecrated before they could go before God in worship and to sacrifice. 
This, this was a requirement that was done throughout scripture on several occasions. It was an act of preparing yourself to be in the presence of God because they understood that you just couldn't come to God any kind of way. Even the priests didn't even show up any kind of way. Because when they got ready to go before God, they would have to get themselves together and in fact they would have to tie around them some bells and some whistles just in case if they went in the wrong way. If they didn't hear those bells jingling and jingling, you'll pull them right back out. Why? Because you can't go to God any kind of way. Would you tell somebody you can't go to God any kind of way? Go, 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 go down, go down, get up, know the horn. Put, put, put oil in the horn, get down to Jesse's house, tell him, come on with me to sacrifice. When he get there, they ask him, do you come peacefully? Samuel said, I come peacefully, but, but, but come on with me, because I've I, I come to sacrifice to the Lord. Verse 5 says, purify yourself, come with me to sacrifice. Then Samuel performed the purification rituals for Jesse and his son, and invited them to come on to. Y'all, when we get out of this text, I promise you I'm finished. You've got a reproach. You, you, you've got a replacement. You've got a requirement. But God put some restrictions on it. Right. Yeah, yeah. Just say his boys oh, that's good. come. That's good. But he doesn't bring all of his boys. Uh -huh. He leaves one of them in the field. Uh -huh. The first of Jesse's sons passes before Samuel. Read it in your own time, verse 6 and 7. His name is Elab. Elab means God is father. He, he's, he, he is a fine physical specimen. And Samuel thinks that he is surely the chosen one. When, when, when you got if you got your Bible, Lord, but when, when Elab passed through him, Samuel said in verse 6, surely this is the Lord's anointed. But God responds to Samuel and said, no, I refused him. The word refuse here in Hebrew simply means I rejected him. Eli, y'all, might have looked pleasing outwardly. But something in his character disqualified him for being the king. Y'all, Abinadab is next. Abinadab names mean my father is no he too passes over, but is rejected by the Lord. Then you got Shema. Shema means astonishment. This may refer to his physical size or some other physical trait, but no matter how good he looked, he too was rejected. Then one after another of Jesse's sons passes before Samuel until seven of them have passed by and they all were rejected by the Lord. Physically, they had it. Well, Any one of them would have possessed the physical requirements to turn heads and rule as a king, but none of them possessed the right kind of heart that God wanted. God saw what man could not see. Even Samuel was impressed with Elab, but God wasn't. Even Samuel was impressed with a bit of that, but God wasn't. Even Shammah impressed Samuel, but he didn't impress God. And you would have thought that Samuel would have learned his lesson with Saul. Because Saul looked good to the eye. But Saul had a corrupt heart. Because of that, God put some restrictions on Samuel. He tells them, don't you look at their appearance. Because the king for my people won't look like the king in appearance. But he's going to be a king because of his attitude and his appetite for me. Here's Samuel's issue, and I promise you I'm about to hang up my hat, and I'm about to ride the way. Here's Samuel's issue. Although he was up and functioning, he's still grieving, and his grief, in his grief, he's trying to find someone that looked like Saul. And God is saying, I don't need another Saul because I rejected him. I need somebody new. Can I help you all grow when I promise you I'm done? Stop trying to go after what you're familiar with. God wants to give you something new because of what you were familiar with. Because if it was good enough for you, then God would have never rejected it in the first place. This is one of the reasons why God said in his word, Behold, I'll do a new thing. Because
because the old thing wasn't good enough. Whenever we judge people off of what we see ocularly, we look or overlook the qualities that people who may not look the part, but they are who we really need. The Bible says that Samuel asked Jesse, he said, I know you got one more son. But Jesse said unto him, listen, you don't want that boy. In fact, he don't look as good as my other sons. He, he's been working in the sheep field. He smells like sheep. He's been around the sheep. He even start to look like the sheep. But the Bible said that Samuel said, bring him on in. And Samuel looked at him and said, Jesse, you might be right. He may not look the part. But if I'm looking at him, I can't do it on my own. Because God has already given me some restriction. So I've got to take what I'm looking at and remove my perception. And I need to get the perception of God and I need to do what God told me to do. The Bible says that after a while when Samuel filled the horn with oil and he put it on David's head the oil ran from the top of his head and it went all the way down to his feet and Samuel he may not look like it, but surely, surely, this is the one. Would you tell somebody, God always has another option. God always has somebody else. Be not dismayed whenever God rejects. Oh, 
for giving us another one. One that's better. May not be as perfect, but thank you for giving us another one. That's why you sent your son, Jesus. You gave us another one. That son gave us life and life more abundantly. And I thank you for that. I thank you for my brother and sister that's watching this morning. They were like Samuel. They been moping and mourning and crying over what you've rejected. Get up. Get up because I've got another one for you. And this one, you'll see, is better than what you had before. So thank you. Thank you for my brother and my sister that made their commitment to come to Christ. They did not do it publicly, but privately in their heart. They said, Jesus, Save me. And if you offer that prayer, that seal the deal of your salvation. So I thank you for that. Bless us in Jesus' name. Amen. Listen, listen, we don't want to leave this morning without giving you an opportunity to give. It will appear on the screen the ways in which you can give. Listen, if this ministry has been blessing you through this pandemic, bless the ministry. Bless the place that feeds you. Bless the place that has taken care of you throughout this whole pandemic. And whenever you honor God, God will honor you. So we thank you for your gifts. We thank you for your continual support. 
of this ministry. We're praying that as you sow into this ministry, that God rebukes the devourer for your sake and pour you out a blessing that you will not have room enough to receive. So we thank you. As we leave this place, listen, continue. Wear your mask. Wash your hands. Wash your hands. Wash your hands. And wait six feet apart from people. Listen, until we meet again, now unto him who's able to keep us from falling and to present us faultless before the presence of his throne. May the God of peace, love, joy, and comfort rest on and abide with us henceforth and forevermore until we meet again. Amen. God bless you.